if they had to. Anybody? Yeah, awesome. Uh, so that's interesting. I got another couple questions to ask about. It just helps me understand, you know, get a sense for who we're talking to. Obviously, you're not part of a, a group called Urban Explorers if you're not interested in doing some interesting things, but I'm, it, I imagine you come from all parts of the region. So the first question is, how did you get here? Who got here uh, by car? <laughs> Anybody get here by bike? Uh, anybody walk besides me? All right, awesome. Yeah, no, awesome. <laughs> nice work. Anyway, skateboards? <laughs> Rollerblades? The other idea I had to ask was, um, uh, because it gets to sort of some of the ideas that I want to talk about, which is the places that we live and, 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 and why we live where we live and where we want to live. Um, who grew up in a community that was walkable and now lives in a community that's walkable? Who? Who grew up in a community that was not walkable, but now lives in a community that's walkable? That's me. Who grew up in a community that was walkable, but chose to pick a place that's not walkable now? <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. That's all right. There's no judgment. And this is actually kind of what I want to talk about. Um, it matters. I grew up in Chambly. We, we could walk to the school and stuff, but we couldn't walk everywhere. And it was a very car dependent community where I lived. Um, and you know, it, the, your world sort of starts to frame your worldview and, and makes you change the decisions that you make about living or not. And my worldview was shaped by 285. My dad's office was off of Beaufort Highway at 285. So we were sort of went motors industrial, back and forth all my childhood. We never really had a reason to come into the town. Uh, moved down here when I was in college and sort of fell in love with the city. Haven't left. It's cool to watch my kids worldview being shaped by this thing and it gives you a lot of hope for the future that all of the problems that we've created over the last 60 or 100 years that we might actually have a chance of solving them my own life story my own family's history is sort of a parallel to the history of sprawl it help, helps illustrate it my grandmother and grandfather uh, were lived in uh, they met and lived in alexandria louisiana my grandfather was a banker when they got married um, his boss con convinced him to get one of these new fangled loans and move to the neighborhood on the edge of town. And it looked like, the family photos look like those classic American images of Levittown and sort of the early suburbanization. Um, my parents moved to Atlanta uh, from Louisiana in 74 uh, to take advantage of the booming economy that was a result of these uh, highways that we were building everywhere. Uh, we bought a house in a neighborhood that was incentivized by the construction of 285. My dad took a job at an engineering firm uh, designing pump stations and wastewater treatment plants to support the sprawling economy. He grew up poor, and, th and, this, and that infrastructure lifted millions of Americans, including my own family, to economic prosperity. It did what city building is supposed to do. Um, uh, it put dinner on our table, it sent me to college, you know, so the, um, again, it's not about that kind of judgment, it's about understanding that relationship between infrastructure and the way that we live our lives, that it matters what we build to the outcome that we get, and that if we want something different, that we might be thoughtful about what we build. My wife and I met in graduate school at Georgia Tech. My, the Beltline was my graduate thesis. Uh, we live now in a loft next door to Kevin, and one of our favorite, one of our favorite things to do, actually, is when, when we can convince ourselves that our kids are old enough to uh, be at home by themselves, <laughs> We'll just come down here, they can text us, and we'll sit here and sort of watch the world go by <laughs> and drink a glass of wine. It's pretty awesome. You know, I grew up in Chambly, a year abroad in Paris. You know, within a month, I'd lost 15 pounds. It was in the best shape of my life because I was walking everywhere and I was eating fresh food. And the connection between the built physical place that we live and my own health and well being um, was really um, interesting and really changed the way that I saw. Um, the world. So I got that really was what got me interested in infrastructure and the role that it played. And so the whole idea here is that if we think about where we want to live and what kind of infrastructure it takes to to have to operate to live in that place, then we go back and we start to build that kind of infrastructure instead of just sort of building the same infrastructure we built for a long time. So yeah, I mean, this whole thing is like the not so secret, big secret is that this is all some ulterior motive on my part to like, <laughs> this is the kind of life that I want. And, uh, you know, here we are. And I was going to ask you if anybody has ever fallen in love with infrastructure. <laughs> I'm kind of an infrastructure nut. 
I'm in love with the Los Angeles River. Who, anybody been to like in the Los Angeles River? That, yes, that, I grew up out there. Yeah, 51 mile concrete channel, the post-apocalyptic backdrop from every uh, movie coming out of Hollywood. But there's been a movement since the 80s to make it into some other kind of place again, some, some place that you would want to be, go to and live near and utilize. Um, it's the same story as the Beltline. It grew out of grassroots movement. And then the last few years, they've made enormous progress. And, and like the Atlanta Beltline, it's not only going to change the physical form of the city, it's going to change the way that people think about it, LA, uh, why they want to live there, what, what they do when they go there. I hear all the time that the Beltline is the reason that people especially young people who are just in the beginning of forming their network that's going to become their career. It's the reason they stay. It's the reason they move here. And they're falling in love with their city again. And I, I really am, I kind of love that idea that I think, you know, infrastructure can really, it's, the, it's not just a way to move from point A to point B or a move, way to convey water or sewer or power. It's the foundation for our, our lives. It's the foundation of our economy. It's the foundation of our cultural life, of our social life. It, it affects everything. This would not be possible, as you know, in Atlanta without that strip of concrete. It's not this thing so much, like Kevin's uh, restaurant and the patio here. It's that we're compelling a life. We're compelling people to do things differently, to live their lives differently, and that's really powerful. What the Beltline did in the early days, back in two, between the summer 2001 and the summer 2004, we built this amazing grassroots movement of people to support this idea. The people of Atlanta believed in this vision for their future. It gave them something to believe in. And, and so when it obligated then the elected officials and the regional planners to come on board around that and start to put the nuts and bolts together to make it happen, um, I think that we could do that at a regional level. Um, but it's going to take a lot of work. And the thing that got the Beltline off the ground was uh, I was working for an a architecture firm. We were doing master plans for mixed use urban infill development. A lot of it happened to be on this abandoned railroad corridor. Um, I was doing, um, I was an intern uh, designer at the time. Uh, we were doing the master plan for Inman Park Village. And um, we were trying to decide, I was, you know, we we're trying to decide, do you take the parking garage that's now there behind internal to Mariposa Lofts? Do you take it and jam it up against the abandoned railroad? Or do you orient the project toward the railroad, hoping it would become something else one day? And I was telling my coworkers about this idea I had in school, and they thought it was cool. Um, and so we talked to some other people about it, and those people thought it was pretty interesting. And so we, the more people we talked to, the more people wanted to hear about it. We got connected with Kathy Woolard, and she was the city council president, and we took that conversation citywide, and it grew out of that. What it, the, the communities that we went to, we were working through the neighborhood planning unit system, and they were all responding to the redevelopment of this territory right here, Inman Park Village, that little building I live in, Highland Walk, all these projects were emerging at that time. And people, were, people who had lived in these communities, who had seen devastation, highway, fighting highways, fighting bad zoning, fighting blight, fighting all the sort of negative things of the, sort of the onslaught of the 20th century for urban communities. Um, they were, they were, they, and then they saw change coming. Suddenly these properties were desirable. Suddenly they were attracting uh, denser apartments, uh, big buildings. You could, you could see the future that it was going to start driving uh, density and traffic. And the Beltline was lifted up at that very moment um, as a way to um, maintain their quality of life in the face of that growth and pressure. So it's a really powerful thing to think about that in the face of inevitable change, subconsciously, communities took, didn't fight against that change, didn't say, no, we're not going to allow all that to change to happen because they saw that it was good for their communities. But they took that change and they leveraged it to their advantage. They leveraged that change to actually implement something that would protect their quality of life. And that was a really strategic thing um, for us now, but also for your question about the regional question about the future. But we have to remember both um, where all this is coming from, but also where we're going and that, that you know, you think Pont City Market is going to be a game changer for this town? It is. But what about when the shopping center across the street gets developed with 15-story towers all the way up through the movie theater? You know, what about when all of these properties get, you know, that's, it may not be in the near term, but it's certainly happening in the long term. And if we don't protect our quality of life by protecting this corridor, which is a free-flowing corridor for mobility, then we're going to be in trouble. So I think Atlanta's 
you know, unique because you fly into the, in the city and you see this wonderful tree canopy. Um, and we need to define what it means to be a city that, that retains that kind of canopy. We're at the sort of beginning of this sort of big cultural momentum. If you think about Sprawl, started in like the 40s, it wasn't some conspiracy. It didn't happen overnight. It was millions of people uh, making millions of decisions over an extended period of time. We didn't call it Sprawl in the 50s. We called it the future, you know? <laughs> and, and, it, and it was, and nobody could have imagined where we were going. Um, and so in the same kind of way, we, cha we completely changed our life in the process, not only the physical world, but also every uh, government agency from local to federal is organized around that way of life now. Um, business is entirely caters to uh, that way of life now. Um, but, but with p so many people being fed up and changing what they want um, and shifting this into inventing these new kinds of things, I think that we're sort of at the very forefront of a much larger kind of cultural change that similarly is going to have those kinds of impacts. That's similarly going to change businesses to uh, completely adapt to what is new. It's going to completely adapt uh, in, uh, government agencies to, to build things like this more easily and faster. And we can either, as we go, as we make those changes, we can either uh, protect those corridors or not. Um, we can protect that habitat or not. We can protect the, the other parks and cultural sites and historic buildings and things like that or not. And that's certainly a, a challenge with the Beltline. You know, we're focused like a laser beam on the, on the, on the thing and the technical aspects of the, just doing the basics because it's so hard. Uh, but there are other things that, uh, in my mind, are, we're falling short on. Preservation is a great example. We're losing historic buildings left and right. Now, that's kind of Atlanta's MO, you know, uh, but we could be more thoughtful about it, um, especially um, design is another one. You know, we don't really have an, a great ethic for higher quality design, materials. That's a, there's an educational component to that that's true. There's a lot of really amazing things going on in this town, you know. Um, there's a lot of people, I mean, I didn't know anything about this group until uh, Steve called me. And uh, it's amazing. There are people out there, you know, making a difference, getting involved, learning things, changing the way that every, things are happening. So who knows what we can do? Is the economic impact um, that we see here going to be comparable to on other parts of the town? Uh, the answer is yes, that it'll happen differently and it'll happen on a different kind of time period. I think it's important when you see the success uh, what's happening here. This is really built on 30 years of investment in this part of town. The Beltline is relatively new in this process. Uh, the Beltline is accelerating change. It is certainly amplifying that change, um, but that change had started in the 70s. Uh, when neighborhoods like Inman Park, people started fixing up houses, um, seeing the beauty of these Victorian mansions um, and sort of reclaiming these spaces. That's not gonna happen overnight on the west side. Um, and, or on the south side, and I think we need to be patient. It'll happen faster, um, and, that, and that gets in again to the soft side of what we're doing, the soft side being sort of people and making sure that people uh, get to stay, that the people who made this thing happen get to stay and enjoy it. Um, that's another kind of challenge that we're facing. The, the, op the economic opportunities are different on the west side. The physical opportunities are different on the west side. Uh, issues of identity and all of that are, are different and you want them to be because you don't want the same idea sort of smeared around 22 miles. You want to get out and sort of enjoy the rich diversity of the city. This project has gone through its knocks. Uh, it's, it's, it's a survivor, but it's a survivor because people believe in it and because they're empowered and that they have that, that structure for change. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Urban Explorers TV. I'm Pam Ahern of In-Town Area Homes.